Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to Playlist. This is all my video game pickups for the month of January 2020. Uh, welcome. Strange month. Uh, got a lot of video game stuff and a lot of stuff that isn't really video games. Like, look, there's a Bob Ross action figure. We'll get to that. But uh, also just weird month in general. Uh, I was sick for a good chunk of it. I was all over the place. Uh, I mean, really, like, all over the place in different different countries and stuff. And uh, also kind of threw my back out briefly, which really sucked. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, now time to talk about some video game pickups and just various things. Uh, before we do any of that, though, the first thing I want to talk about is a game that I'm giving away. Uh, thanks to a company called Go Collect, which I'm working with now, uh, they hooked you guys up with the opportunity to win this. This is Revenge of the Bird King for the PS4, and I'm sure a lot of you guys already know about this game. It's frankly the infamy around the game. I will say this though, I'm not allowed to elaborate on the real side of what actually happened with this and why it's so rare and all that, but I will say this. The game, the story you've been hearing about like, oh, they created an artificial scarcity, blah, 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 to hike up, none of that's true. None of that is true. What is true, unfortunately, is that NDAs that would tell you the true story are designed to protect the guilty <coughs> Sony and uh, pr uh, punish the innocent, aka the people who actually were involved with the production of this game. Um, now, I'm not allowed to go into details of that, but I will say this. If you want to win a copy, you have that option right here, right now. All you have to do is uh, subscribe to my channel and subscribe to Go Collect. I'll put a link in the description to their channel and you're entered to win. One person will get to win this copy. Go Collect will determine the winner, but that's all you have to do is subscribe to both of us and you're entered. So thank you very much to Go Collect for that possibility. Now, uh, that was acquired down at, uh, in North Carolina, I went down there and I got that at uh, the Limited Run Games pop-up shop, which was a really cool thing, and uh, it's finally cool to be able to show you guys a little bit of that footage, but um, whatever. Moving on. <laughs> Thank you again, Go Collect. Now, the next thing I got, you might have already kind of noticed that something's a little bit different. This isn't a video game pickup, but it is something I really wanted to show you guys last month, but now I can. I picked up a Sony 4K Handycam, the FDR AX53. Uh, yes, I got a new camera. Oh my god, it actually happened. It's time. You know, we're in the future. It's 2016 now. <laughs> this is a four-year-old camera, but it's still really good. I got this recommended to me by a bunch of different YouTubers, so it's, finally I'm able to upgrade the camera. So, yay, everybody can enjoy that. For all that 4K goodness of the wall and the shelf. <laughs> but either way, it's a better camera. I don't dispute that. But uh, yeah, so I got that. But that's obviously not really a video game thing. But I was trying to show that last month, but the, the problem with this camera was... I ordered it, it arrived, and it was defective. It was dead out of the, uh, dead on arrival, it didn't work at all. Uh, so I had to go through the returns process, which was like, oh great, fun. But uh, then it arrived, the second version, and now it's fine. Everything seems to be okay, so yay. Um, so, cool. Now, let's move on to some actual video games. Uh, the first one up was sent to me by GG Retro Gaming. This is uh, Spyro Year of the Dragon, or Spyro 3 for PS1. Uh, GG Retro Gaming actually just informed me, like today, that uh, they're no longer going to be doing things through their own website. They're going to start doing things through Amazon and eBay. So this is kind of a remnant of their previous era. So I guess just a shout out to GG Retro Gaming. And they're starting to move over to this uh, to TikTok for their social media outlets. So congratulations to them on their success. And I wish them well. But either way, thank you very much for hooking me up with Spyro Year of the Dragon. Um, after that, I got a random stack of Xbox games. Uh, because I've mentioned before that I... Uh, have been trying to get a full set of original Xbox games. This, but in this case, that wasn't actually my goal. There is something in this pile I actually did want specifically, uh, but it didn't pertain to the original Xbox. I just happened to find these while I was looking for said item. So let me go through these games real quick. Um, nothing really special as far as the Xbox goes. Amped 2, which was an original Xbox exclusive. Uh, Burnout 1. ESPN College Hoops aka uh, 2K4, um, Frogger Ancient Shadow, and Kabuki Warriors. These were all for the original Xbox. The thing I was actually looking for, and I'm glad I found it, was, it's, you'll get it, NBA Courtside 2002, which is not something I would normally go out and look for. This is for the GameCube. Um, this, of course, featured Kobe Bryant back when he was wearing the 8. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of you know, even if you're not into sports, that he just died in a tragic, horrific way. Um, that was... That was bad, man. Um, so when that happened, I was I was in midair. I was flying from Washington, D.C. to Chicago. And I landed. My phone just blew up with news about it. Now, uh, and I did, you know, social media posts showing, like, a Kobe Bryant autograph that I had when I got, that I got when I was a kid and showing a bunch of basketball cards I had. 
Um, a lot of people saying, like, I had no idea you were, like, a big uh, sports fan. I'm not really a sports fan, but more of a basketball fan. I mean, I grew up in here in Chicago in the 90s during the Jordan Bulls era, so it was gonna, that was going to attach itself to me. And despite being, like, a huge Bulls fan, you know, and obviously Jordan was the guy, I've never liked the Lakers as a team, but I, I respected, always respected Kobe Bryant. And, and even in that, you know, I've always thought the NBA went from – the Jordan era to the Kobe Bryant era to the LeBron James era. And to have Kobe Bryant be gone only like two years after he retired is just kind of insane. Um, that was that was intense. I couldn't believe it. And then, of course, all the other people who died on the, the helicopter crash, including his, one of his daughters, just horrific, man. So, uh, you know, I remember I got to see him play in person just one time. Uh... One of his earliest years was the the 98 season when the Bulls won their last title. The time that the Lakers came to Chicago, I saw one of the few times that Jordan ever played against Kobe directly. I was at that game uh, in Chicago. Uh, and I just I, I just remember Kobe doing this like pinwheel dunk like in midair and just stunned me. Um, I was like, wow, that's like the second coming of the same guy who's already on the court right now. That guy's going to do big things. And he did. He really did. Um, so even if you're not a sports fan, it's just tragic that the, the way in which someone like that would go out is just, just reminds you, man, like stay humble and stay happy and try to enjoy life while you can, because even with all that kind of success and power and fame, stuff happens and you can just, you can just be, it can be snuffed out and it's, um, you know, go, hu go hug a loved one tonight. Okay. <laughs> Cause that was, that was some intense, intense stuff, but I didn't get this because, oh, all the Kobe games are going up. I mean, that's unfortunate reality of stuff that's happening, but that's not why I got it. It was just my way of kind of paying my respects in addition to, like, social media posts, which are just a way to, you know, mourn. This was to pay respects, was to just go out and be like, you know, I'm supporting you as one more time as best I can. So, yeah. Anyway, got that. Uh, moving on. As I mentioned, I am... I am a big Bulls fan, or was. The current Bulls iteration is terrible. But um, I was in Guam earlier this month. Um, I've been to a lot of places this month already. But I was in Guam briefly, and I went into an ABC store. Now, if you've ever been to Japan, Guam, or Hawaii, I'm sure you've seen these because it's a big chain in those areas. I think I've seen a couple in, like, you know, Southern California, but it's not super common there. It's basically like a Walgreens, like a drugstore type of thing. They sell touristy stuff, but also just, like, you know, over-the-counter everything and a little bit of, like, local merch, um, you know. And in this case, they, I saw something that just caught my eye. Uh, it was this hat, which I don't usually buy hats, but I was like, oh, cool, a Chicago Bulls hat. You know, the Chicago Bulls logo is everywhere. You'll see it in countries all over the planet. Cities everywhere. I mean, I see people walking around in Cuba with these things. You know, it's just, wow, okay, the Bulls are beloved. Awesome. Um, it's like that and the Lakers are the ones you see all the time. But then I looked at it a little closer and I noticed it said Guam Bulls. And I was like, it doesn't mention Chicago <laughs> anywhere on the hat. And then I looked at the, the logo. It was Hong Ding Cap, Snapback, High Definition Fashion. This is a very cheap Chinese, like, pirate hat. Like, one of those ones that you would, uh, you know, you would do Google Images and see, like, that... Obama Sonic Harry Potter backpack, you know what I'm talking about? Like just one of those fake pieces of merch that's just meant to get your attention. I was dumb enough to actually buy it because I just thought it was so hilarious. I was like, okay, so my beloved Chicago Bulls couldn't survive in the third biggest U.S. city market. They had to be relocated to Guam. I don't know. It was just hilarious to me. So I just had to have it on that basis. Um, but yeah, I know you guys aren't into sports, but whatever. It's just stuff I want to talk about. But moving back on to video games. So I went out to California, uh, specifically Los Angeles. I actually had a gig out there. This is kind of cool, by the way. Check this out. I'm going to be doing... I did the voice of Soren for a new Magic the Gathering game called Mana Strike, so you can go ahead and check that out. And I also got to go down to the Warner Brothers lot, which was awesome. But a buddy of mine convinced me. He's like, dude, fly out to San Francisco instead. I'll pick you up. We'll do some stuff, and then I'll drive you to L.A., because then you'll have a car in L.A. as well. And I was like, okay, fine. So when we got to San Francisco... Uh, he was like, oh, there's this little, like, game swap thing happening. Do you want to go check it out? And I was like, sure, whatever. So we went to that, and uh, a lot of people were surprised to see me there. Because it does happen. That's the only place I really ever get noticed is, like, oh, dude, I watch your channel. What are you doing here in this random, like, are you local? Everyone thinks I'm local from everything I'm at because I'm always at random stuff that I have no business really being at. But anyway, no. Uh, so I walked around this swap. I didn't really find anything I wanted until I randomly stumbled across one item, which was this. Sega Genesis controller. And you're like... 
You didn't have a Sega Genesis controller? No, I got a million Sega Genesis controllers. In fact, even pulling the trigger on this felt really stupid. But I looked at it and I was like, there's something weird about this because it's like the official molding and it has the official colors, but then it's like, it's got Mega Drive colors, but it's not a Mega Drive controller because it doesn't actually say Sega on it anywhere. So I was just really kind of perplexed until I looked on the back and I saw this. It's a Blockbuster logo, Blockbuster video logo specifically. And I was like, was this like a rental controller at Blockbuster? What is this? And I did a little digging and I found out that what this actually was is at one time Blockbuster was making their own third party Sega Genesis controllers. And I was like, that's cool, um, as someone who's become somewhat nostalgic for Blockbuster especially. Now, the controller itself is nothing special. It, you know, it's just, it was a cheap little controller I bought there for a few dollars, but just cool because it was actually Blockbuster. I may not keep this though. There is that one last Blockbuster in Bend, Oregon that I did a video on. I'm sure you've seen a lot of my, I wear this Blockbuster hoodie all the time because I bought it there and I love it. It's in a lot of my social media posts. But um, I've been thinking about if I ever get to go back to that Blockbuster, I might donate this controller because they have like this little museum of stuff that was exclusive to Blockbuster, but there's almost no representation of video games in there. So having like the official like Blockbuster Sega Genesis controller in there might be kind of cool, but really that was just, I got it more to preserve it than to actually use it. Um, so moving on, uh, it's, let's see, where, where else can I start here? Let's, let's stick with the video games for a bit. Actually, we'll switch to something that's not video games and then go back to video games. Um, this is as about as random as it gets. On the flight to, uh, so when I was going to Guam, you have to go from Chicago to Japan, Japan down to Guam. Um, so on the flight to Japan, uh, I, I was sitting in the back and I got, I actually ended up sweet talking a flight attendant into hooking me up with this. <laughs> this is a random, uh, in first class, what they're doing right now for United is that they're giving away these like Star Wars Rise of Skywalker swag bags. They have like a little keychain thing and here it says Star Wars and United and then the bag itself says Star Wars and inside is just like, it says it on here, it's got uh, hand cream, face cream, lip balm, cleansing cloth, toothbrush, earplugs, tissues, pen, um, and stuff like that, and an, an eye mask. And it's all like Star Wars themed. Um, I like Star Wars, despite what I actually thought of Rise of Skywalker. It was just kind of cool to just, they just hooked me up with one of these. That was nice of them to do. But uh, yeah, so I haven't even opened it or anything. It's just kind of a cool little like thing. You know? And the other thing that oddly enough was United Airlines related. I mentioned that I flew back from Washington. I was changing planes there going from uh, Newark, uh, New Jersey, to Washington, D.C., to Chicago. Strange route, but that's what I had. And when I was in D.C., uh, I went over to my gate and I, I saw this guy who I was like, he looks really familiar. Why does he look so familiar to me? And then it hit me. I was like, oh, this is how much I fly. That's the CEO of United Airlines. And I'd seen his face like a million times in all those like ads where they're like, you know, buckle up for safety and all that. And I was like, well, that's cool. Um, and then a bunch of like, you know, the employees are like getting photos with him and stuff like that. And I was like, do I do something here or do I just sit down? And I was like, you know what, this, this, this is an adventure. So I went over and I talked to him. Um, I got a photo with him and then I actually tweeted the photo out and United Airlines actually responded to it, which was hilarious. Um, and then I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I asked him if he would sign my boarding pass and he did. <laughs> so I, for some reason, felt the need to get the autograph of the CEO of United Airlines. It's weird what you start to care about when you do certain things a lot. Like I fly constantly. So all of a sudden it's like, Ooh, that's exciting. Um, I know it's strange. So you guys probably don't really care about that. So let's move on to something else. Um, I, after I did all this stuff in California, I had a bunch of stuff, like I had a gig down there in LA. I also was at the Warner Brothers lot for a while. That was pretty awesome. Um, but after all that stuff, uh, I went to Texas. So that was a strange day because I flew from San Francisco to Chicago where I live. I went, I didn't even come home. I left the airport, went to my mom's house to like basically do laundry as if I was straight back from college, uh, clean myself up, take a shower, go right back to the airport and then grab a flight down to Austin, Texas. Um, I got to Austin, Texas. I hung out with my buddy Chip. I was stayed at his place for a few days, but the reason we went there, if you guys remember Chip, he was on my podcast for like an entire year. Um, but we went down to PAX South. Uh, I was invited to PAX South. So here's my badge, content creator badge and all that fun stuff. PAX South is, PAX South is the weakest of the PAXs. I've only been to PAX West and PAX South. I've heard PAX East is great, just never been to it. PAX West is fantastic, but PAX South is more like tabletop gaming and like indie games. It's not, it's not a good PAX. Um, the primary reason I was there, aside from just getting to enjoy going to Texas, so we, we went from Austin and drove down to San Antonio, which is like mm, 70, 80 minute drive, it's not bad. Um, 
we went in there because uh, I wanted to check out Streets of Rage 4 via Sega. So got a nice little photo op with all that stuff and got to play Streets of Rage 4, which was quite fun, by the way. Um, but that was pretty much it for my entire like business reason for going to Texas. And then we went back to Austin, hung out, and then I came back here. But while I was in Austin, uh, we went to a few different stores, and one of them was called Game Over Video Games, which is a chain throughout that area. And they actually had some cool stuff. The first thing I actually got there was this. This is the Metal Gear Solid vinyl. Um, this is a two record deal that actually has a bunch of music, like the full, I think it's the full score of Metal Gear Solid, which I've always thought was great music, but having it on vinyl is awesome. Something, it's definitely a thing that happens when you get older, and my tastes are changing a bit. I'm more interested in like video game scores now than I ever was, and having them on vinyl is even more awesome, even though vinyl was never a format I was into. It was pretty much dead by the time I was old enough to understand what it was. Um, and I never had one until a few years ago when uh, a guy named Spock Avriel sent me a record player and I just started popping in a handful of the promo ones I had and I was like, whoa, this is actually, I get it now, it actually does sound better. Um, and I'm not even a music guy, like, at all. But uh, having some of these video game scores was really cool. So when I found out there was a Metal Gear Solid one, I, you know, I was all over that. So that was really cool. And the other thing that they had uh, was this. This is, in, it's, in, it's in need of service, but this is a Sears Video Arcade 2. Now the thing about this is they had it in a clearance bin. They were listing it for $20, and I was like, $20, and it comes with nothing, and the cable on the back has been severed. Someone cut this thing. So I was like, 20 bucks, even for that, is not a very good deal. So they were willing to give it to me for 10, and I took it because a buddy of mine said he could fix the, the, the wiring because they can just take it out and you can do a composite mod to it. And then the power supply, I think I have one of the spare ones sitting around somewhere. And I have plenty of Atari 2600 controllers, which is essentially what this is. Now it looks like an Atari 7800, and there's a reason for that. I didn't know this, I was doing a little bit of research on it. And so basically what happened is, um, when Atari was bringing the Atari 2600 over to Japan, they slightly retooled it, they upgraded it a bit, made some changes, and they called it the Atari 2800. Um, and they used this type of molding. Um, and it didn't really do well over there. And they eventually brought those units back over to North America, and then they slapped on, they had a deal with Sears, who put Sears Video Arcade 2 on it. Uh, in an attempt to kind of make you think it was something different than just an Atari 2600. And they more or less just kind of finished off the units that they had. That's pretty much all this is. It's kind of a more sought after version of the Atari 2600, but it doesn't really do anything special to it. It's got the same basic features on it. The only thing that's really special about it, I guess, is the four controller ports. Although, I, while there are certain situations in which you would need them, kind of uncommon. Um, but other than that, it's, you know, it's an Atari 2600. And then they eventually would repurpose these cases for the Atari 7800. I always thought it was the other way around, like they did this after the fact, but no. They, they kept these molds and then decided, okay, we'll just use that for the Atari 7800, making the Atari 7800 even cheaper to produce um, than it already was. But yeah, so this needs maintenance, but cool. I got another version of the Atari 2600 now. Uh, so moving on, uh, I, okay, so now I got some packages here that we're going to look at. Uh, first one comes from Castlemania Games. Uh, now, he's been sending me a bunch of these lately, and I want to show them to you guys. Uh, I already showed the uh, first one. Here's the newest thing. This is, and I'm sure you guys saw it before, the Brawler 64. Now, I did an entire video of this originally for the N64. However, this one is specifically for the PC, Mac, and Switch. This is USB-based. So if you liked that controller, you can now use it on those platforms. So this would be good for, like, you know, emulating the N64 on a PC or whatever, or if, you know, there's any type of uh, N64 game that gets put onto the Switch, or if you just like the controller in general, you'd have that option now. Because, you know, even though it's more or less designed for the N64, it would still work with things that are not N64 games. It's just that that's where it would probably feel the most natural. Um, I can tell you already that the basic controller is already good. I quite enjoyed it originally. My, my thoughts on it were the thumbstick wasn't the best, but aside from that, I quite liked it. So this is essentially exactly the same thing. So thank you very much to Castlemania Games for hooking me up with that. Um, and I also got some various Shenmue merchandise. Um, my buddy Jerry, uh, who lives out in California, uh, he hooked me up with some random, uh, he hooked me up with a random thing. A bunch of GameStops over there are going out of business, so he was friends with some of the people who run them, and he got me this. I have a few of these. This is a just a, a piece of art that would go inside of a pre-order case uh, for Shenmue 3 at GameStop. So it's the Shenmue 3 artwork, but at the top it's just the way GameStop would display it and has the GameStop logo and stuff on it. Um, these were never even used. He, he had like 10 of these, so he gave me like five of them. Um, I might do a giveaway with one or two or something like that later, I don't know yet. But that's what it looked like. So it's cool to just add that into the Shenmue 3 collection. And speaking of GameStop and random pieces of collective stuff, you might have kind of noticed it down here but I hadn't acknowledged it, was this thing. 
Uh, this is actually like a big like standee thing that would go into um, like a big like kiosk type of mount in GameStops. This actually came from Guam. I actually took a photo with this last year <laughs> while I was in Guam, uh, right around the time that Shenmue 3 was about to come out. Um, but my buddy Brian, who actually lives there, he's friends with the people who work at those game stops. And he's like, yo, when the game's out and you don't need this anymore, I want these and I'm going to give it to this nerd guy. And they were like, yeah, whatever, we don't care. <laughs> and so thank you, Brian. So when I was in Guam this time, he had it for me and I actually brought it back. It got a little damaged on the return, but that's, you know, I just didn't have a bag big enough really to fit it. So it's just kind of like keeping it in my backpack and hoping to not mess it up too bad. But either way, it got back here. I've got it now. So thank you very much to my buddy Brian for hooking me up with that. Um, so cool. Yay, Shenmue 3 stuff. And speaking of more Shenmue 3 stuff, I wanted to show this last month, but it didn't arrive in time. This is the Shenmue 3 Picks in Love Edition for the PS4. This is a French collector's edition of Shenmue 3. Uh, it uses a green art scheme, which I find kind of confusing because it implies that it's like an Xbox version when it's definitely not. There is no such thing. Um, but they, I guess they didn't go with blue because the, they did a Shenmue 1 and 2 collector's edition uh, that was all blue and maybe that was like a decision in there somewhere like they didn't want it to look the same i don't know i feel like even though i like the green design i feel like it's a tad confusing because it's not even a central theme color of the game uh blue is just kind of what they've been going with um but you know maybe it's meant to represent lon d i don't know but either way or the the, the mirrors possibly but regardless it uh it is definitely cool to have this addition in the set because i it is a goal of mine i want to try and get every version of that game and speaking of that possibility, um, a buddy of mine in the UK, his name is Skill Jim, or that's the handle he goes by, sent me this. So we're going to go ahead and open it up, and it should have some random other goodies in it. Although it's packaged rather well, so this might be trickier than I had thought about. But uh, sorry, that was uh, harder to open than I had expected. So let me pull out the guts there. And it looks like everything. We got a little box here. I'm not entirely certain what this is. Although I think he must have mentioned it at some point. Oh, <laughs> Yes, he did mention this. This is a, uh, a Sega Saturn PC controller he sent me. I remember him mentioning this now. Uh, this is a USB-based Sega Saturn controller called a Play Sega controller. He said this was made in like the late 90s, I think it was, specifically for PCs of that era. So it uses probably like USB 1 on it. Um, probably nothing I'm ever really practically going to listen to the clickiness of those triggers. Wow, this thing is cherry. <laughs> so I'm going to put it back in the bag. But thank you very much uh, for hooking me up with that skill, Jim. That's just a nice little random thing to add in there to have in the Sega War. I wonder if it would work on um, like an Xbox One or something like that. I'll, I'll take a look. But uh, the reason he really sent all this stuff was just some various uh, Shenmue 3 um, items, if you will. Uh, first and foremost, he sent, me, he sent me a bunch of these. What are these? Some Oh, these are like pre-order slips for Shenmue 3, the UK version. He sent me a bunch of these. How did you get this many of these? Um, yeah, wow, okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. These are pre-order slips for Shenmue 3. So they're much like the GameStop one, except that these are the, the UK edition. And there's one, two, three, four, five. Oh, cool, and I have five of the other ones. So we'll do some sort of giveaway at some point. I'm gonna do some sort of giveaway. We'll give away some of these. Thank you, Skill Jim. Uh, he also sent me this, which is a different one entirely. Uh, from some other store. It's another pre-order slip for Shenmue 3. Uh, very cool. Thank you. And he sent me this. This was something, this was pretty much the reason we had discussed this whole thing in general. Uh, this is the Russian edition of Shenmue 3. Yes, there was a Russian edition of this as well as the Shenmue 1 and 2 re-release. These are harder versions to get because in general, the Russian stuff doesn't really make its way to the West, um, but not that it can't, but it just typically doesn't. But uh, yeah, this is the Russian edition, so very cool to add that to the collection. So thank you very much, Skill Jim, for that. Um, so cool, added more random versions of Shenmue 3 and just other random items. Speaking of random items, though, uh, we got two left. One is not a video game, and one is. The non-video game item, I just want to give a quick shout to. I got a Bob Ross action figure, and if you don't know who Bob Ross is, I'm sorry for you. Bob Ross, I don't know where he got all of his popularity all of a sudden. This is a man who was a painter on PBS for like 30 years. And in 94, he died. And out of nowhere, he just got like super popular like three or four years ago. I kind of think Deadpool 2 played a big part of that, but I don't entirely know. Although I do know that I watched a whole bunch of Bob Ross like painting videos and they're awesome. It's just like, it's like early ASMR, man. It's just like, I don't care how mad you are, sad, whatever, you're feeling down, you watch some Bob Ross, you'll feel a lot better. So, yeah, they, they made an action figure out of him out of nowhere. I'm like, this is awesome, so I had to get that. Um, anyway, just a side thing. But the other thing I got, which was hilarious, 
So I was in uh, New Jersey, and I was hanging out with a buddy of mine named Rob. And apparently, I don't know the, all the details of this, but I guess his dad at one point worked for Panasonic. And they had a Panasonic store. And after the 3DO went under, uh, at one point they had a whole bunch of 3DO inventory just like in the back and it just stayed there forever. At one point Rob got to go in there and was just told more or less like take whatever you want, we don't need any of this stuff. And so he found a whole bunch of 3DO stuff and he was taking and he was enjoying it. And he found a stack of something extremely strange. And one of them was this. This is a game called Love Bites for the 3DO. This is sealed, brand new. And it was sitting there with a stack of other copies. He had like six copies of this sealed. So uh, what's the deal with this? This is not a game, but it was officially released. Um, the thing is, the 3DO was desperate for content, officially licensed content. So they did something unconventional, which was they more or less let anybody who wanted to make a 3DO game make a game. The development fee was so low, or the publication fee was so low that pretty much anyone could do it. So this one company called Vivid Entertainment, which is a porn company, decided they wanted to make games for the 3DO. And all they did, is my understanding of this, is in the early 80s, this guy bought up a whole bunch of incomplete films. <laughs> uh, stuff that where they had sh you know, shot certain scenes, but not all the scenes, and it therefore was incomplete, just unusable footage. This guy thought in the early 90s, well, we've got this new medium. I can use like a menu system that just says, click here to watch this. And just you just watch a scene without any context. And that's how he essentially tried to resell the same footage. And what was the perfect device for that? The 3DO. And thus we got Love Bites. And there's a whole bunch of other ones out there. But he had a giant stack of these. And he was just like telling us about it, how this whole story and how he had a bunch of these. And it was like, that's kind of hilarious. Um, didn't really think anything of it, but as I was leaving, he was like, you know what, man, take one, throw it in your collection, keep it safe. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. This is going to stay sealed. I'm not going to open this because I certainly have no desire to play this. But uh, yeah, it's an, not a common game either. So thank you very much for Rob for hooking me up with this. It's very random, very strange, but very awesome of you. So thank you. So that'll do it, guys. Uh, if you guys could do me a favor, like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff, I appreciate it. Thank you very much to Rob. Thank you very much to Skill Jim. Um, thank you very much to my buddies Chip, Jerry, Jesse, Brian, uh, GG Retro Gaming, um, RIP Kobe Bryant, and um, of course, uh, if you guys you know still want that copy of Revenge of the Bird King, don't forget, uh, subscribe to me, subscribe to Go Collect. I'll put a link in the description. You can enter to win a copy of that, and it'll be yours for free. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all later.